Good morning, everybody. And what a great day we have this morning. Glad to have everybody with us, those that are with us in the sanctuary this morning, as well as those watching by live stream. We welcome you to First Baptist Church of Hope Mills. I'll begin our service this morning by reading from Psalms chapter 29, verses 1 through 4. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory due his name. Worship the Lord and the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord, the Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. Now let us worship Pastor Harrison. Would you pray with me this morning? Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you today with hearts full of gratitude and praise and thanksgiving for all that you have done and how you have taken care of us throughout this week. We have faced challenges, whether health or whether other friends that we know of, but yet you've been faithful to us even though we have not been faithful to you. Lord, we thank you for the gift of this beautiful day and the opportunity to gather here in your presence with your people. For those that are watching live stream, we welcome you this morning in our service and in our prayers. As we come together to worship you, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit fill this place, touching our hearts and our minds and changing us. Lord, we seek your guidance and wisdom. Our eyes, open our eyes, open our ears, rather, to hear your voice, open our minds to receive your word, and open our hearts to embrace your love. May our worship be pleasing to you, O Lord, and may it draw us closer to you and to one another. We lift those who are struggling today, whatever in body and mind and spirit, those in the rest home, those in prison and those in the hospital, those in, in our, our, our soldiers and those that are serving our great country. We pray for them. We pray for their families. We pray for their health. We pray for their spiritual well-being. We pray for those who are ministering to them, Lord, that you strengthen them and encourage them in these challenging times. We pray for those that are not with us, that we pray for Pam Kelly, we lift up uh, Ryan Blackwell, we lift up uh, and, uh, <coughs> Evelyn Kreiner and others, Lord, that are not with us today, Mike's, Mike Spells and some of those that are going through some challenging times today. Bless our service today. Lord, we pray for those that are, are lost those who are strung out on drugs of any kind, we pray that you save them. And those who have wandered away from the Lord, we ask you by your Holy Spirit to gently guide them back for your son, to your son Jesus. And as we enter this time of worship, we lay aside all of our distractions and burdens. We focus our thoughts on knowing that you are our strength, our refuge, and our hope. Bless this service, Lord. That everything we do here today bring honor and glory to your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the call of worship with grit and grace. Thank you, Lord. What a great God you serve, right? All right. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way and who shall wear the starry crown good lord show me the way yeah. oh sisters let's go down let's go down come on down oh sisters let's go down down in the river to pray
starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Amen. You may be seated. Good Lord will show us the way. What a great day to start our service this morning. Welcome again to First Baptist Church of Hope Mills. Do we have any visitors for the first time with us today? Anyone celebrating a birthday? Thursday. Thursday. Great God. Anyone else? Let us sing happy birthday to Pat. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And we wish you many more. Anyone celebrating an anniversary? Guess not. Anyway, today's, uh, this month's uh, memory verse comes to us from Psalms chapter 25, verses 4 through 5. Please stand and let's recite the verses together. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your path. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Amen. Please turn to your neighbor and pass the peace of the Lord.
I'm here in Our Lady of Lords Church where I spent eight years of my life going to Catholic school, going to Catholic church. A lot of memories in this building. You got the stained glass window in the front with Jesus getting crucified. There's something that's the stations of the cross, Jesus' life all around the room. You got the candles up front. You got the confessional back here. But I want to show you something. It's something we did every time we walked in here was we dipped our hands in the holy water. And there's the holy water. You would dip your hands in there and then give yourself the sign of the cross to bless yourself. And the reason it was holy, because it was set aside for a very specific purpose. It was only used for certain purposes. It was still water, but it was set aside. It's not like if you drank it, you would start glowing or anything like that. If you want to be holy, set yourself aside for the purposes of God only. You don't belong to anybody else but God. Let him use you in your job and your family, but you belong to him. And if you set yourself aside for his purposes, he'll do the rest as far as purifying your life. So be a holy man of God, a holy woman of God. Set yourself aside just for God's purposes. Amen. Let's please stand and praise our, give our Lord the praises. Before we, before we get started this morning, um, I guess we're supposed, to, we're supposed to play right. Okay. I want to let you know that Brian, our drummer, will be taking a little leave of absence. Hopefully he'll be back sometime. He's going home back to Pennsylvania. Is that correct, Brian? Going to look after his father. He's got... And mother, so um, we're gonna be missing him. And also today we have uh, I have a special lady here with me today, just singing. You've already heard her voice to start off with. I met her and Brian. They happen to be husband and wife, so you know. But I met them at I'm home. the wife. He's a, she's the wife. I met them at the Aldous Billy Choir, and we've become good friends. And we got known. They and she graciously came to play with the band today, and I appreciate it. I hope she'll come back. She's just got a new promotion. We have one off of five. Amen. And so she's, um, she may be leaving. So, but I, I went, I want Will to go to his best people he can find in the military to get her to stay so they'll come back here. So find everybody up, up there. Yes, sir. Okay, we, we appreciate them being here. And we, um, we really have enjoyed her singing and Brian being with us. And I hope they will come back and be back soon.
should have said something about this song for Earl Young because Deborah always told me to preface a song before I sing it. So I didn't listen to her today, so I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> this song, For Ever Young, as you may have known it, if you're my age, you've heard it for years. It was done by Bob Dylan, Ralph Stewart wrote it. But when I heard this documentary on this song, I realized the real meaning to that song is that when we leave this world, however how we work through our lives, live our lives here, and we leave this world, when we go to heaven, as we always said, heaven is paradise, and we're always going to have a new body, as Will would tell me, and we're going to be a new person so we'll forever young. So that's the reason we chose that song. I 
shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day. again, everyone. Good to have you and to see you in the house of the God, of the Lord. Arnold and Rena back there, wave to the pastor. That's it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you for the music. Thank you. And uh, we appreciate it very much. Inspire us. Yes, Ron, you do have to give us an introduction of your songs. You're getting better. Thank you much. Thank you for everybody that does work around this church. Um, many of you, we just appreciate it so much. Uh, the smallest details or the smallest work we do is very much appreciated. This morning, I would like for you to turn with me into the book of um, Psalms. And this is going to be a two-part sermon, which I'm only going to cover the first five verses Lord willing, I'll cover the next 6 to 12 or 6 to 10 next week. But I want to start out this morning highlighting Psalms 51, verses 1 through 5. And I'm going to be reading from the uh, New International Version. And this is the Psalms 51. And it goes like this, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression, I know my sins, in other words. He says in verse 3, and, and my sin is always before me. Then he says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. I'm going to stop at that verse 5. My sermon titled this morning, The Power of Confession. The Power of Confession. This psalm, many believe, was written as of David's uh, Response in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through chapter 12, verse 9 of 
text of, of 2 Samuel. Uh, this is a psalm that many equate David writing in his response or in his behavior when he committed adultery with uh, Bathsheba. But not only that, but because she, because David had her um, husband Uriah killed as well. So it was almost like a double whammy. I don't know about you, but this verse speaks of one who's in spiritually agony. I'm not talking about a spank on the hand here. This is something that David has wrestled with, maybe even before Nathan the prophet came to him. He realized that he had sinned. And that it was troubling, deeply troubling his soul, agonizing uh, remembrance of what he had done. He was one who was in total despair. He found no hope within himself. He had to look to God because only God can forgive sin. We may forgive each other's behavior, but we can't forgive another person's sin. That's why the Bible tells us to forgive one another. But as human beings, we cannot erase a person's sin. All we can do is follow God's mandate by forgiving one another over and over again. David, in this particular passage of Scripture, the act of confession does something for us. It releases. It opens up the heart. Because the heart is always wanting to be touched by grace. Did you get that? The heart is always in need of being touched by grace. Not condemnation, but grace. God's grace is what saves us. God's grace is what exonerates us. God's grace is what frees us to be ourselves, to love one another, to forgive one another, to encourage each other. God's grace is what comes in our hearts that causes us to feel the peace and, and the tranquility of God himself. David was in a miserable state. And maybe some of you out there listening, or maybe in our church, you're going through some turmoil, inner turmoil. Maybe because of things that you've said or something that you've done that haven't been uh, rectified. But as we look at this psalmist here, what we're going to notice God does not come in the picture in the sense that God is doing anything in turn. David first starts out, and he first starts out by asking God for mercy. Why would David do that? Why would David ask God for mercy? Look what he says. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Why would he do it? Why would he ask God for mercy? He needs it. He asked God for mercy because he knew God to be what? A merciful God. Nobody understands you. Nobody knows you like God does. God is merciful because that's his nature. David had this long-standing relationship with God for years, and over the 70 years of his life, he only lived to be 70 years old, by the way. Didn't know if you knew that. A very short life. So many of you have outlived David, including me. <laughs> only 70 years. But in that period of time, David had developed a strong relationship with God. He knew if he can find mercy... It would come from God only. Matter of fact, this whole prayer is to God 
asking God for mercy. Now, these are one of the uh, psalms that are used during Lent. Do you recall what Lent is about? You come from a traditional church of Lent. Lent is what, 40 days? 40 days of what? Come on, Baptists. 40 days of fasting and what else? Praying and repentance. Here's one of the psalms that is often recited during Lent time. That 40 days of fasting and prayer is also include repentance and confession. David appealed to God's mercy for come, uh, to, to, to uh, confess to God for mercy. David realized his own error. He realized his sin. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, God's nature is mercy and compassion. Look what it says here. The God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and fill with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish uh, unfailing love to thousands of generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. For one to appeal to God for mercy, one would have to be in a relation with, with the God of mercy. Did you get that? For one to appeal to a God of mercy you must know the God of mercy. Because no one understands you like God. God knows why you have made the choices you have made. God understands why you made the decision. God also knows the, 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 uh, you more than you know yourselves. He's a God of mercy. He knows you. He know all about you. God eagerly, listen to this, he scans the world looking for those who are crying out for what? Mercy. God's ears are always open throughout the world and throughout the universe for any person who is crying out for mercy. Because he's that kind of God. He loves to hear people say, Lord, have mercy on me. You heard me many times tell you about my dad. He wasn't a church-going man. I know he didn't live like a church-going man, whatever that's supposed to mean. He was a sinner. That's who my dad was. But each morning before he went to work, I would overhear him say the word, Lord, have mercy on me. I don't know if he was saying that because those sugar cane fields that he was about to get to, get get ready to go and work in, (laughs) in the hot Florida sun, I don't know. But it stuck in my mind. Somehow, some way, He had come to realize that if anybody knew him and loved him, it would be God. You can appeal to God for mercy because God knows you. You can appeal to God for mercy because he loves you. God is not stingy with his mercy. He's not holding it back. He's not giving it to some people and and withholding it from others. God is merciful. God is also compassionate. The power of confession allows us to appeal to God for mercy. What does it mean to ask for God's mercy? The word, the Hebrew word there, is a word that means womb, womb of love. And in that particular Hebrew word, it means that God's womb, 
And ladies, you know more about this, especially those who have children. You understand what that means. I remember my first duty station, I worked at Fort Lewis, and there was a lady there who worked in the religious department, and she had a son who was always strung out on drugs. She was always, he was always on drugs, and, and many of her friends and even religious friends of her would tell her, why don't you just give up on him? You have sent him to rehab and nothing has changed. He spends your money and nothing has changed. And she went on and they went on and on and telling her. And one day I asked, I said, why do you continue to support him? You know what her answer was? She said, I have a mother's love. A mother's love always what? A mother's love always what? even when their children are at their worst. If there's one person who's going to stand for you in times of crisis, in times when life is not going good, it's going to be who? It's going to be your mother, not your daddy. I'm sorry, us men, we are going to berate. You shouldn't have done that. You know that was stupid. But what is a mother's words? What would a mother's words be? A mother's word is simple this, I love you. Let me tell you something. That is the way God's love is. That is the way God's mercy is. God doesn't sit around waiting for us to make the next mistake because he already knows. He doesn't sit around waiting to punish you. You punish yourself. You're your worst enemies. You're your worst destroyer, not God. My Bible tells me in 1 John chapter 4 that God is what? Not only is good, but he's love. That's God's nature. You see, our nature is different. <laughs> we love and we what? We hate. That's, that's our nature. But God's nature is only love. That's all you'll ever find in God. When you, meet the, when, you, when you stand into the presence of God, now this is what I've heard, don't know for certain. Some people with near-death experiences, this is what they have told me. I heard them, I read, I read some of it, and some have told me that when they stood in the near-death experience, all they could experience was L-O-V-E. Overshadowed them. David knew that God would have mercy on him. Let me tell you something. We got a God that have mercy on us too. When we get out of line or when we get off track, this God of mercy is there for us. David is not appealing to God just asking for a light sentence. He acknowledges that his sins deserve judgment, but he is relying on what? God's loving nature. My friend, we all have sinned. We all will sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. This should cause us to live in a state of what? Humility. This, this should cause us to be more compassionate and forgiving to others because God is loving and forgiving you. David appeals to God for mercy because he knew the God of mercy. Do you know it? Do you know of God or have you experienced God as a God of mercy? Another interesting point in this, this uh, verse that David says, in verse 2. He says, let me go back to verse 1. He said, blot them out. According to your unfailing love and according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. 
The word blot means to erase. Erase. Now, you remember in the old school days when you had a chalkboard there, uh, Cheryl? You remember that? When the teacher would call you up and ask you to write something on the board and you write, but it's all crooked? Well, that was me. I'm really describing myself. But I'm going to use you as an example. And you get an eraser and you do what? But sometimes you don't erase it all, do you? David was asking God to blot his sins out. Get an eraser and just wipe it clean. Did God honor David's request? He sure did. But here's the problem. David never forgot. He never forgot his own sin. Wouldn't it be nice if we forget all the bad things that we have done? You know, I think about that. Would it be good? Yeah, you'd be good, wouldn't it? But if, if, if that happened, what would happen to us if we forget all the bad things? Besides all of us who are going through some mental slowness right now, which includes me. Huh? You may repeat it. But here's the thing about... Uh, 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 Maybe, maybe, sometime my wife will say to me, don't you remember this? And I'll go along and say, yes. <laughs> you too. Don't look at me like that. You do the same thing. <laughs> he up there looking at me like he's holy all of a sudden. He know he does the same thing. He'll, he'll do that to, uh, to, 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 to uh, <laughs> Pat, see? And all, see, I told you, good example. Live illustration of forgiveness. All right? But here's the thing. Um, we never forget. Maybe God don't want us to forget. Maybe that if he, if he wipes it all the way and clean it up, we have a tendency to do what? To do it again. So maybe sometimes there's a point, there's a memory loss, and, but at, at the other times, maybe it's a good thing that we don't. David asked God to blot it out, erase. Now, this is David appealing to God. Then he says in verse, uh, uh, let me go back to uh, 1 John 1, 9. Confession is good for us because uh, it allows the soul to connect with God, okay? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and forgive us our sins in all unrighteousness. But, but here's the problem with that. What if we go back and sin again the same thing? What, what, what if we go back and we sin and do the same thing over and over again? Does God forgive us? Y'all believe that? He does forgive you. Not only does he forgive you, he cleanses you. But here's the problem with us. We're the one that go back and go, get to what? Get dirty again. Yeah, God doesn't, but we do. So he has to cleanse us all over again. He has forgiven us. He cleanses us. But we go back and get back into the dirt pile all over again. But here's the thing. The power of confession. God is faithful and just and will forgive you. God is not responsible for you going back and doing the same thing. That's you in old sin nature inside of you. And this is what David says again by a power of confession. He, first of all, he owns up to his own personal sin. Look what he says in verse 2 and 3. For I know my transgressions. How does he know them? Huh? 
Not only did he did it, but what else? He always remembers. He remembers what he's done. He said, I know my transgression. You know, the problem with many people today is that they won't own up to their own flaws. And everybody has flaws. Everybody's a sinner. From the pope to the rabbi to the priest to the iman, whoever. The scripture tells me that all have sinned. And by, cause, by, by, by knowing that we all have sinned, we are all at God's what? We are at God's mercy. None of us have bragging rights on this earth. None of us are more holier than the other because it is by God's grace that we have been what? Saved. Not because of what you've done and what you didn't do. It's because God has extended his mercy and his love through his son, Jesus Christ. And because of that, he's become the atonement for every sin that you will commit in this world and also the world, not, not in the world to come, hopefully. But as long as you live on this earth. But here's another thing. There are consequences, isn't there? Yeah, the consequences of our sins could be... Uh, David realized that, first of all, he says that, um, for I know my sins, they always appear before me. Now, let me ask you a question. When is most likely your sins haunt you? What do you say? At nighttime. Somebody else said what? In relationship. When are most likely your sins seem to reoccur and, and, and haunt you at night or whatever? In the quiet hours, when you're by yourself, when you're listening to who? You. I was watching a news clip the other day where uh, folks were flying from different countries and they had these individuals, I forgot what they called, the young people are doing it. Old people don't do it because we fall asleep during that time. <laughs> but the young people were uh, staying awake and they were head on, looking straight ahead, not watching television, not texting. For seven hours, they were staring. And I don't know what the name of it or what they call it, but it was something on the news the other day that I was saying, one guy said, that's the craziest thing he ever done, to not say anything for about six hours. And not even look at his text, not even watch a movie. Six hours of just staring. Well, I don't even know the point I was going to make behind that now. <laughs> be honest with you, I forgot. I really did. But I'm going to something else since I forgot that part. <laughs> yeah. You see how... You see what I mean? You know, God is forgiven. This is mercy here. This is mercy. I, I, I just lost my train of thought, uh, Toby, and uh, I can't remember what it is. But I tell you what, I'm going to go on to another point. Maybe that's God saying, move on. And I ain't mad with him. <laughs> you know, I want to get out of here too. <laughs> Y'all are some good people, but I'm ready to go. David acknowledged his sins. Look what he said. For I know my sins and they are always uh, before me. And then in verse 4, he says something else. My sins are always against who? God first. Look what he says. Against you and only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak. And God is proved right if he chooses to bring judgment on me. There's no excuses. David acknowledged. The power of confession here is that David is being exonerated because he is going to God in humility. And this is what God seeks. He seeks a person who is humble. You're not going to get into the kingdom of God or get to heaven on your own strength or your own merits. You're not going to get there. I don't care how many 
times you go to church or how many times you read your Bible, how many times you pray, that's not going to get you to heaven. Now, those are avenues or to keep you in a right relationship with God. Those are avenues to keep our relationship with God intact. But salvation comes only through Jesus. We all are sinners and need help. We all are sinners and need God's mercy and grace. David says in verse 4, against you, you only have our sin and done what is evil in your sight so that you approve right when you speak. He says, I stand condemned. This is why I ask for God's mercy. I stand, I stand condemned when, when the memory of the past comes and haunts me in the wee hours of the night. By the way, the devil, the scripture tells us in the book of Revelation, your accuser. You know who your accuser is? The devil is your accuser. And what is the devil's whole intent of accusing you? It make you feel what? Bad, guilty, unworthy, and dirty. That's what the devil does. He wants you to walk around feeling uh, dirty. He wants you to walk around feeling guilty. He wants you to fa- uh, walk around feeling unworthy so that you can live a life of what? Shame. That's what the devil wants you to do. Let me tell you something. God's grace and mercy have delivered you from that. You don't have to walk around being ashamed anymore. Yeah, we all have sin, but you don't have to walk around feeling like you're ashamed because God, through Jesus, have taken that away from you. You're delivered from that. You're now free. You can live like free people. You can live in God's grace and realizing that through God's grace and emot- uh, salvation, he, he has exonerated you. Why is uh, a confession so important? Confession allows individuals to unburden themselves of guilt, shame, and regret. Did y'all get that? Why is it important? Because it, again, it allows individuals to unburden themselves of guilt, shame, and regret. By articulating these feelings either through prayer to a trusted person or within a religious context, the emotional weight is lifted. When I worked into the prison system some long time years ago, an inmate came into my office. He said, Chaplain, I need to talk to you. Come on in, sit down. He said, uh, he said, I witnessed some some years ago. He said, I witnessed a murder. And, um, and I witnessed this, and I was brought to court, and I denied that I had ever seen anything or saw anything. He said, but you know, he said, I've had to live with that. And he said, but every night... The person that I saw, that I witnessed murdered, every night I would see that person at the foot of my bed. And they would stand there and they would look at me. And he said, I wake up in sweats, sweating and and, and like a nightmare. He said, but every night, even in prison, I see this individual face because I should have told the truth. I'm living the consequences of guilt. As he confessed, I guess I was the first person he's confessed to. And he said to me as he was leaving out of the office, he says, I feel better. I feel better. 
That was another incident in the military in Hawaii when I was stationed there. A young lady was uh, uh, one in my unit. She had also witnessed a murder, but never witnessed, never told anyone. She came and said, Chaplain, I have something I need to talk about. She said, I witnessed a guy being murdered, and I denied that I ever saw anything. She said, but it haunts me. She said, what do you advise? I said, well, evidently you won't find peace until you tell the truth. I advise her to find a way to tell the truth. That was my advice to her. I said, only then, with your confession, you will feel exonerated and lifted because you did the right thing. Confession also restores relationship. When we've hurt each other, when we've said things, confess. Uh, I think Steve Harvey uh, had a thing last night we was watching, and one of the questions he asked, he asked that if you drop your wife's uh, toothbrush in the toilet stool, what would you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was one of his questions to some of the people. And one guy said that he would, uh, do what? You don't remember either? <laughs> <laughs> Help us, Lord. <laughs> but anyway, whatever he said... <laughs> And uh, finally, someone said, I think, um, I know what he said. The the other person, the first person said, I'm going to buy another one. Yeah. Okay. How many points did they get for that? Zero? Or maybe two? But anyway, the other person said, I will tell her I am sorry. That was the answer. Why do we make it so complicated? Why do we make it so hard? Simple thing, all he needed to do, all he needed to do was tell his wife that he had accidentally they dropped her toothpaste, excuse me, a toothbrush in the toilet stool and go get another one. Simple as that. Don't, don't, don't use it. Don't. Here, here's my another point I want to highlight, and then, then I'm gonna be done. I'm gonna let y'all go home, go to um, Chick-fil-A or whatever. <laughs> Oh, they close on Sunday, excuse me. You can't, so you're going to have to go to uh, your favorite Kentucky Fried Chicken. But here's, here's, here's my last point. Here's my last point. This is what David says here. Yeah, I'm going to let y'all go home. He says something here that goes way back. And I don't know if he was trying to give an excuse, but this is what he says. He says, surely I was sinful at birth. What did David mean by that? He said, the reason I did what I did, the sin that I've committed, because I inherit these things. I inherit this sinful nature. You go back to the book of Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, the whole human race became sinful, and the original sin, that's what they call it, was passed on to every human being. But why do we do the thing that we do? Because of our sinful nature. We lust, we greed, we, we, we act for greed. We do things because the nature that we were born with. This is why you can, uh, the, the power of confession allows us to admit to Almighty God that we are sinful, man. If there's any mercy, he has to give it to us because we can't exonerate ourselves. We can't free ourselves from the prison that we've gotten ourselves in. When David acknowledges his sin, when he says to God in verse 5, I was, now he was not blaming his mother. He was not blaming another human being. He was just simply saying, he was just simply saying that this is the this is the way it happened. When I came into this world, the one thing that I'm going to start doing is sinning. You don't have to teach a baby to sin. They come out fighting. 
My son said to me the other day, we were talking about evil in the world. And he said to me, he said, Dad, you know there are some evil kids? <laughs> I said, well, you can ask the school teachers. They'll know a bit more about that than... He said, no, no, no. He said, there are some kids that are born evil. And I looked at him. He said, evil. He, he emphasized again. And I said, yeah. Maybe. But David says here in verse 5, he says, I was sinful at birth. This thing, what I did with Bathsheba, was not the beginning. This thing started by my very nature. That's why Jesus died for us. Because our very nature is what? Corrupt. Our very nature has is, is, is already been tainted. That's why the blood of Christ. That's why we ask for forgiveness. And guess what? As long as you live in this world, you're going to continue to what? You're going to continue to sin. You're still going to be rebellious. But by confessing to God who you are, there's mercy. Did y'all get that? By confessing who you are in your sin, there is mercy. Not mercy to continue the same way you live, but mercy, forgiveness, and exoneration, and a freeness. There's nothing like living a free life. Did you know that? Not attached to anybody or anything, but to God only. That's a beautiful life. And that's the kind of life God wants you to have. One that is dedicated to him. One that is free with him. That's what he offers us through his son Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you today and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures. We thank you, Lord, that your word is more powerful than what I have said today. It is more powerful than my illustrations or my gestures or my forgetfulness. Your word is more powerful than all of this. Your word is more powerful than this congregation set in today. So, Lord, we rely upon you today. We do confess our sins. We do acknowledge that without you, we are lost. We do acknowledge without, that we are sinners in need of salvation. And the only way we're going to get it is through you, Lord. Even when we sin, you tell us to come to you and ask for forgiveness. And here we are this morning, this day. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, the Anointing One. For the Scripture said, by the blood of the Lamb... They have been saved by your blood, Lord, only through your blood, Jesus, that we exonerated. And we thank you for the gift of salvation. In Christ's holy name, amen. Today, the children will be going back to school tomorrow. And we have children. I want them all to come up here for prayer. Any of the children today, if you want to be a child today, you come too. All the children come today as you prepare to go back to school. Anybody who wants to come, you come too. Everybody's welcome. But I want the children up front. Cause you can make it without me, Lord. But I can't make it. Yes, thank you, Lord. Bring them right on up here. Let me look at them. Let me see them. Come on up. I need you, Lord, to the river. Yes. Father God. I need you. We thank you, Lord, for our children. We thank you, Lord, for the education. We pray for their teachers. We pray for the school board. Lord, we pray for protection. We ask that you watch over them. Keep them safe as they go to school. And as their parents direct them. Give the parents wisdom. Give them courage. Give them the faith to lead their children in prayer before they go to school. And at night, we ask your watchful angel to watch over them. 
to keep them, oh Lord, in your grace and mercy. We thank you today. We hear your voice, Lord. These are your children. You said, let the little children come unto me. And here they are, standing in your presence. Matter of fact, we all are children. We are all of your children, Father. And we need your help. We need your grace. We need your forgiveness. We need to be exonerated. And so we commit ourselves to you today. And we thank you today. In the name of Jesus. Receive these little souls, Lord. For they are precious in your sight. Watch over them and their parents. And all the kids that are going to school. The teenagers, the high school. The school board. The, the athletic team. We pray this in Jesus' name. We thank you and we commit them to your care. In Christ's name, amen. I need you, Lord, till the rivers all run dry. Yes, thank you, Lord. And I need you, you till the sun falls from the sky. Yes. And I need you, Lord. Yes, Lord, thank you. Yes, thank you, Lord. But you can make it without me, Lord. But I can't make it. Amen. You may be seated. Would the ushers please come forward? Again, is that time for us to give back to what the Lord gives us each and every week? Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you with our offerings today. We are reminded of our constant need for our lives for you in our lives. You are our provider, our sustainer, and you, Lord, you are our strength. May these gifts be a symbol of our dependence on you, knowing that we all have, that we all have comes from your hand, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the way of uh, announcements this week, if you notice in your bulletin again, you'll find a little uh, printout about the, the Bible study that will begin on September the 4th, and it will be the Bible study, the book of Revelation. If you would like to uh, sign up online, you will find a link in this little pamphlet that will give you the address to sign up for this study online, or you can contact Wanda in the office and give your email address to her, and she will do it for you. But anyway, keep this in mind, Wednesday, September the 4th, 3.30 here in the sanctuary, we begin the new study of the book of Revelation. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you are too. The ladies' prayer group, they will resume their meetings here in the church on September the 10th, their regular Tuesday meetings, but September will start with the first Tuesday at Zorba's, so plan to get ready eat some good old grits and country bacon and sausage and all that good stuff and get your bodies ready for the uh, latest prayer group. Looking forward to that. Back to school lunch. There's Sunday, September the 15th, there will be a uh, luncheon here at the church for students and teachers after worship service. If you have a, a, a student or a teacher in your neighborhood that you would like to invite, please invite them to, to come and attend. And there will be pizzas and hot dogs and all kinds of goodies, ice cream sundaes, I think there is, for that event. So please invite your teachers and your students for that event. And also, there would like to be a body count so we would know how much uh, food to prepare. Darlene is taking up that collection or number. So let her know if whether or not you will attend. The almshouse always are in need of, of uh, non-perishable items. Their needs are, at this time, is canned meat, canned fruit, peanut butter, dry beans, oatmeal, 
cereal and box mac and cheese. And if you have any questions on that, you can talk to Janice and she will keep you up to date what is uh, the arm house is in need for. Also, pastoral counseling. If anyone needs to speak to the pastor or any type of counseling, please talk to him or Wanda and they will make an appointment for you. If there is nothing else, Pastor Harrison. Would you stand and receive the benediction? What a great God we serve. Amen. What a compassionate and loving God we serve. I want you to go out of this church today knowing that God loves you. And I want you to go out of here today knowing that God is merciful. He knows you. He loves you. And I want you to go out today to know that God is the God of peace. My friend, experience this peace in your heart. When you leave here, go as people of peace, and the God of peace will be with you. Have a wonderful day and a week to come. God bless you.